Be quiet, will you? They might be closer to us than you think. Oh, uh, no more. Giggling grasshoppers are on top of her right into the midst. Right. I'll teach you guys to creep up on us. <laughs> Look out, Ruggie. There's a couple of guys behind you. Yeah, I'll handle them. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, maybe this will teach you not to choke people. Ah. Uh, all right, come on. We'll give them a taste of how we do it on Earth. All right, run for it, Mitch. Run. Giggling grasshoppers to behind us. Oh, my gosh. Why, you? Look out for that fellow. Uh, uh, oh. uh, all right, never mind him, Mitch. Come on, keep fighting. I am. I'm loving this. In the days when radio still ruled the airwaves and the idea of anybody ever being able to own a television set was a science fiction idea akin to having your own jetpack or holidaying on the moon, radio serials were a popular form of storytelling. You had your westerns, your spy dramas, detective serials, and of course science fiction serials. Usually these were aimed at a younger audience, but as is often the case with these things, it's mostly the science fiction serials that are remembered today. My personal favourite was this, Charles Chilton's Journey into Space trilogy, but I guess your favourite all depends on which country you were born in, and in Australia, one such series which proved particularly popular was Rocky Star. <laughs> Destination Venus, an adventure with Rocky Star. Mitch, there's one of our chaps in trouble. Gorg's mob will get him unless we help. Stand by to change course. Right, standing by. I'll give her a couple of blasts from the forward rockets. That should bring them into line. All right, here they come. Rocky Star was an ongoing sci-fi serial featuring at least 11 different stories, each comprising of as many as 100 10-minute episodes. So from that, we can assume that the series was reasonably popular. So popular, in fact, that the series was eventually adapted for television. Flying Saucers, an adventure with Rocky Star. As you can see, it's a fairly standard example of a low-budget sci-fi series, full of ray guns and model spaceships and all the other things you'd expect to find in a show made in the 1950s. The only difference being, all this was shot in the early 90s. That's right, everything you're seeing here was shot in 1992 and on Super 8mm film to give it a more authentic 1950s feel. But surely they would have updated it in some areas, right? At least the stories will be a bit more sophisticated than they were back in the 50s. Actually no, because all of these actors are miming to the original recordings from the 1950s. And miming pretty well, it does have to be said. You mean... Attack him? Yeah, that's a general idea. No, that'd be dangerous. No, no, it is better that I hide you somewhere in my yacht. Say, Rocky, I'm getting to like this king a whole lot. Thank you. Occasionally they will miss the mark, but nine times out of ten they're pretty much dead on it. <laughs> oh, it won! The premise of the series is a fairly straightforward one. Rocky Star is the daring space captain, aided by his plucky sidekick, Mitch Morgan, and their woman, Diana Moore. And yes, that is Kerry Fox playing Di, just starting out in her career, but famous enough even then that getting her must have been quite a coup. That's very true. Across 25 minute episodes based on the original radio serial Flying Saucers, Rocky and his friends battle the forces of the planet Centaur, led by the evil Zog. I've not been able to track down any pictures relating to the recording of the radio series, so I don't know what any of the original voice actors looked like. But in an odd way, I don't really want to. Not to belittle their work in any way, but the actors chosen for the TV version throw themselves into their roles so completely that it's hard to imagine anybody else in those parts. All the characters look exactly the way you'd expect them to. Take for instance the guy playing Zog. This actor deserves some kind of award for services to boggle-eyed acting. No, no. The range of pantomime villain expressions he comes up with are really something to behold. This guy is having an utter ball. <laughs> and really the same can be said for the entire cast. I particularly have to mention Kerry Fox's Di again, who helps bring so much dignity and strength to a character that on the radio was just the woman. Actually, I think she's the only woman in the entire show. All the cast are great, but Fox has got that knowing twinkle in her eye that really helps draw you into the madness a little bit more. Ah, yes, now I also have to mention the fact that most episodes of Rocky Star feature a musical number which comes right out of nowhere, really goes nowhere, and then disappears just as quickly. 
None of these songs feature in the original radio serial, so at first it's quite a shock to see characters just bursting into song at the drop of a hat. You don't really get to see that in any other show. <laughs> Doing. Man, you're the craziest. Is that the jargon, Mitch? <laughs> oh, by gee, by gosh, by gum, by jar. Actually, it's always disappointing on the rare occasions that they don't manage to squeeze a song into the episode, as part of the fun of the show is trying to see it coming and guessing what kind of song it might be. Let's give you an example. Here we see that the evil Zog has kidnapped Di and is demanding that she tell him Rocky's whereabouts. Now I'm just going to give you a few seconds to consider how this could possibly lead into any kind of musical number, okay? Let's start the clock. Actually, no, we're not going to do that, because whatever you're thinking, trust me, it's not even close. Here's how it goes. They spit on him and all their things. Oh, tell me, will you, darling, why you look so bad tonight? There's bags around your eyeballs, which is red instead of white. I know what you're thinking. You want to not like it. You want to dismiss it as something silly, something childish. But deep down, you want to keep watching. You want to keep watching because you want to know how insane this is going to get. That was part of the appeal of the show. You had to keep watching just to see how silly it would get. As a mud hole tips a mosquito, darling. That's how you tip it. If Rocky Star has taught me anything, and I do feel that it has taught me a lot, it is that there is literally no situation in life that cannot be resolved with a good musical number. Let's say, for instance, your faithful second in command has just been gunned down in battle. Uh, you've been stranded at sea in a life raft. Ship ahoy! Ship ahoy! Okay, okay, okay. Uh, you have been captured by your arch enemy, and you've been thrown into a prison camp, and you find your girlfriend is there, and she's serving gruel. Shoo, fly, fly, an apple fan. There is literally nothing that you guys can't turn into a huge production number, is there? It's really quite extraordinary. I never get enough of that wonderful stuff. Di, as much as I respect your need to express yourself through your music, it would be a great help right now if you could just put the saxophone down and help us look for a way out of here. There's no way out. Don't say that. By the way, it, it is good to see you. Oh, it's good to see you too. But don't stop working or the guards will flog you. <laughs> yes, but evidently spontaneous musical numbers are just fine, aren't they? I'm afraid I don't know all the secrets of the universe. With the overwhelmingly retro vibe that the entire series has, it's interesting to put Rocky Star as a 1990s sci-fi series into some kind of context. At a time when American TV science fiction was wowing audiences worldwide with new big-budget shows like Star Trek The Next Generation and Babylon 5, and British TV science fiction was... non-existent, Australia were repackaging an old radio serial from the 1950s as the very first sci-fi musical comedy. I have spent many long hours trying to get my head around the sequence of events that could possibly have led to this decision being made and I've come up with nothing. It almost feels like it was made on a dare, or was just commissioned by an insane person. Actually, the minimal information my researchers managed to turn up points towards the original seeds of Rocky Star being planted back in the early 1980s by two art school students, Stephen Harrop and Stephen Fernley. Together, they began experimenting with the idea of producing films to match a pre-existing soundtrack, again taking a 1950s children's radio serial and filming visuals to accompany it on 8mm. It was really, really important to me and Steve 
that we were originally coming from an audio point of view and how we can dislocate and harmonise the image with the sound to, I suppose, create a different kind of narrative that wasn't, clearly wasn't there in the original children's radio play. This collaboration is what eventually led them to producing Rocky Star, and indeed both of them also appeared in the show, Harrop in a number of minor roles, while Fernley played Rocky's sidekick Mitch. He's got a lot to answer for. Better think twice, don't say we're parting bad friends. Better think One of the other big influences that we had at the time was a television series called Pennies from Heaven, which was created by Dennis Potter. And this show was all about the Depression period in England. Don't say we're through. When anything horrible happened, they would break out into song. And it was great to see that, to counterpoint the way that, say, Hollywood musicals use music. While I suspected at first that the songs were only there to help cover some of the missing narrative, it can't have been easy cutting 110 minute episodes down to just 25 minutes. Looking at the musical numbers from both shows, the Pennies from Heaven influence is felt quite strongly. Just a fiend for romance is she. Despite all these different influences and sources, the final product is still very much its own thing, with its own unique sense of offbeat humour. Part of the fun that I think the people working on this must have had would have been in sneaking in little visual jokes. Because the soundtrack is so embedded in its own world, there's a great potential for visual humour, which they definitely took advantage of. There are lots of little gags in there, and it is one of those shows where you spot something new each time you see it. Now, I really hate it when people look back at old shows and read hidden meanings into it that weren't there originally. Thankfully, that's something that the producers of Rocky's Star managed to avoid with Rocky and Mitch's relationship. They make it very clear that Rocky and Mitch do share a bed. Wake up. Uh, Mitch, wake up and don't make a noise. There's nothing here that you could misinterpret. You know, you're a kind of queer guy, Rocky. Nothing at all. Rocky doesn't give women a second thought. Nothing that you could, uh, could, could, could read into it, as it were. I'm that happy I can kiss you. <laughs> don't be a peanut. Got you! Oh, die! Oh, Rocky! Huh. Is this the way you greet your friends? Oh, friends usually knock, not try to slip through the keyhole. Well, I saw the light was out and I, I thought you might be having some excitement and I'd be left out of it. I'd rather be with you two. Stop that, stop that! You're not going into a song while I'm here. And from that day, never more will I say there's no use. Rocky Star the radio serial had spent 40 years forgotten in the wilderness before it was adapted for television, and sadly the same fate seems likely to befall the television series. It does seem to have been relatively successful at the time. In fact, it won several awards at the Chicago International Film Festival. We can do it! Run! Run! Here in the UK, it was shown at least twice on BBC Two, the first time being shown after Star Trek The Next Generation, which obviously is where I saw it. Now on BBC Two, Rocky Star needs his own space. Even at the time, I remember being baffled. Was it a genuine 50s sci-fi serial? Well, the end credits seemed to hint that it wasn't, but it was so authentic and so true to the period that it couldn't possibly have been anything else. I'm afraid that this is the end. The end? This is only the beginning! But sadly, once the 90s drew to a close, repeats of the show dried up, and it's never been released on video or DVD. Nowadays, if you type Rocky Star into Google, you just end up with... yeah, that. In fact, the show is so obscure that it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. For goodness sake, even The Flumps has a Wikipedia page. The Flumps. Episodes 8 to 20 are all available on YouTube, albeit in varying degrees of completeness and quality. But sadly, the first seven are still missing in the void. 
If you happen to have copies of the early episodes, please put them online, because I would love to see how the series began. After all, it couldn't possibly be weirder than anything we got, could it? I couldn't understand it, Your Majesty, but it sounded great. Rocky Star is a genuine oddity, but it's a fascinating one that really deserves to be seen. It celebrates the way films like this used to be made without really poking too much fun at them. Which on Superdrive. They don't, for instance, make the shots of the spaceship intentionally bad. They make them as they would have been made had this been filmed back in the 1950s. The whole thing is a loving tribute to both the radio sci-fi serial and the classic Saturday morning movie serials, while at the same time being something all its own. It's unique, it's bonkers, it's wonderful, it's Rocky Star. Train's exciting adventures lie ahead of our three friends when they leave our world and fly to the planet Karoo. So join us for the first episode of the new and thrilling Rocky Star adventure, The Shadow Men. Rocky, Mitch, do you have anything you'd like to say to the people watching? Straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and stay right. Straighten up and fly right. Cool down, Papa, don't you blow your top. Fly right. Quite well done, wasn't it?